Hi everyone, I'm Barbara Beck and I'd like to welcome you to Current. The ladies and I have a wonderful program lined up for you today as we look for ways to be refreshed, renewed, and empowered. And today, let's add another powerful word, enlightenment. We're going to work very hard toward being enlightened. Lately, with all the craziness happening in our country, I feel like we need to be talking more and more about the subject of racism. So many articles that I've read point to the alarming fact that racism is actually on the rise. You'd think after the 1960s and the civil rights movement that we would be growing toward a deeper appreciation and understanding of all people, that we're all created by God, that the spirit of the living God resides in in Christians, and yet dissent, hatred, and incredible strife continue to grow in our culture, even among Christians. So we're going to be talking about it more and more. Why? So we can be vessels of peace and love. Well, I know the current ladies have lots to say about this very difficult subject. Welcome, ladies. Hello. So glad to have you here with us today. Not something that's fun and light and easy, not like the marriage game show and all the fun <laughs> things that we do, but we need to be talking about this. This is part of your heart, right, Kristen? Well, I think it's important to talk about tough issues. It's important to speak truth about them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, something interesting that I read recently was talking about how we can dehumanize people. Yes. And once we dehumanize people, we see them as objects and not as people. Mm. Therefore, we can commit atrocities against them or feel like they're in fear. So if we're talking about white supremacy, which basically is white people think they're better than mm -hmm. anyone else. Supreme. Um, that they're better. Mm -hmm. So um, basically, what, what, what our country did back in slave trading times, and as Carol and I were saying, yeah. slavery has occurred since biblical times. Yeah. But what we in America did um, was we basically dehumanized African Americans to see them as property, and with that ability, then we were able to sell them. Buy, mm -hmm. You can't buy, sell, and trade people if you see them as people. Mm -hmm. And our ability to heap unkindness and hatred is much easier when we take away the humanity of it all. Yeah. Totally agree with that. And it's funny because in, in doing this study, I've been doing a lot of history study. You and I were just talking about this and, and just the power of even what it did for Hitler. And, and just to add to mm -hmm. that, and then I want to give a scripture that Hitler began to call the Jews rats. Mm -hmm. He mm. had to take away their ability to be human mm -hmm. so they could go do the atrocities that they needed to do to them. But in Acts 10, it really has hit me so hard. It was when um, they were talking about... Um, Cornelius, and he went to Peter, and he, he said he woke him up in a vision. Remember, he gave him the vision three times, and he said, you know, surely not, Lord, you have, you know, he was telling him, I don't ever eat anything impure or unclean. I have never eaten anything ever impure and unclean, and God spoke up and says, do not call anything impure that God has made unclean, and wow. the reason why he told him that, the vision was he was getting ready to send him in to mm -hmm. speak with Cornelius and all that. Well, Jews weren't supposed to go and speak with those people. It was unlawful at that time. Mm -hmm. But God, in my opinion, was setting his standard mm -hmm. in which this is to me what the church needs to begin to speak out against. He was setting the standard for us that you don't call any of my people. Mm -hmm. Remember, we're made in the likeness of his image. Mm -hmm. The Bible says right here, I'm sorry to get so excited. It <laughs> says in um, Acts 17, 26, from one man, he made all the nations. Mm -hmm. Honey, right there, that takes it all. Yeah. We were made from one man. We right. are the same. We might have a little bit of different pigment, but we're made from one. We are brothers and sisters. Yeah. Well, there are people out there, white supremacists, neo-Nazis, the alt-right, who actually believe that they have evolved as a culture, as a race, and they are supreme. Hence the word supremacist. So I think we have to be really, really careful as Christians, what we say, yes. with whom we associate, mm. uh, because I'm telling you, they're in our churches, they're living next door to us, mm -hmm. and they have these feelings of superiority. Words have power. Come yeah. on. Um, and Kristen, what you were saying was so strong. Mm -hmm. The names that they call other people, mm -hmm didn't change the other person. Yeah. It changed. That's right. That's, right. That's right. That's right. It changes your ability to be able to see them as human beings. Right. 
Right. And when you can no longer see right. another person as a human being, and now because mm -hmm. of, but, but it's because of your own words. Mm -hmm. It's because of the things that mm -hmm. you've yeah. said. Words have power, mm -hmm. and words have always had well, power. Well, your husband is a law enforcement yeah. agent. Has he ever been called a pig? Absolutely. Yes. And how does Absolutely. that make him feel? Horrible. Yeah. R remember that my husband not only is in law enforcement, but he serves our United States Army. Mm -hmm. And the difference that he gets treated in both uniforms is completely radical. Mm -hmm. It is not, it is, it is literally about face turn. Why is that? You know, I, honestly, there's so many things that I could blame, but the Bible says that we do not fight against flesh and blood, yeah. but of principalities of darkness. And so mm -hmm. <clears throat> that is really my blame. My blame, again, is the enemy. I know who my enemy is, and I know his schemes, and I know that he wants to cause division amongst, and he wants yeah. to not only cause division amongst my home, but cause division in my mind. And, you know, we, we've had this conversation, Mama D and I have had, where I'm, I'm, I watched a funeral the other day of a, of a widow who had four children. And I, out of respect, will watch law enforcement uniform, you know, uh, excuse me, um, funerals out of respect. I can't, I can't go, but I want to show respect. You know, any funeral that's on, actually, any, anything that's been happening in our nation, I'm like, you know what? I have reverence and honor. I can't even mm -hmm. imagine what they're going through. But I, what I want to be a part of is I want to be a part of viewing it. And if I can give, I will give. Mm -hmm. And so um, I watched this wife, Stan, who was also in, in law enforcement, lose her husband who had four small children and mm -hmm. I have never in my life experienced a fear like I have watching that woman speak about her husband in front of thousands mm. of people and those that were behind the camera. Mm -hmm. I actually got a message from my pastor that day and she says, hey, I'm just checking in on you. And I said, thank you, because I literally wanted to vomit. Mm. I wanted to pass out and I wanted to just cry it, because I for one second, you know, thought that could very well be me. Of course. Mm -hmm. Just because there's a bounty right. of what my husband puts on mm -hmm. every single day. Mm -hmm. But it's the same exact concept right. with your children mm -hmm. walking around, driving from here and there. We've had this mm -hmm. conversation. Yeah. This isn't anything that we're cowarding away and saying, oh, because yeah. she's gorgeously black, mm -hmm. you know, that I can't have this conversation. It is not fair. But what we can do is unify as a nation and say enough yes. is enough. Mm -hmm. We are not going to bury another law enforcement officer nor are we going to bury another black child, another black son, yeah. or another black father. Because why? Because we are going to unite right now, right here, today. Not anymore are we going to bury people in innocent blood because our enemy is the one, really. And, and I think the way that we can help is by putting the sword in the right place. We need to stop putting the sword up against each other's necks and begin to put it towards why or have we not as a nation come together as a prayer visual straight across the on, on a Sunday, straight across our nation like we used to pray. Come on. Because we no longer live in that culture. That's right. But this is why we, we as a mandate have to stand up and church. say and, and yes. say, you know what? We have been cowards. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry if that offends you, that's good. Because we have cowarded away from what is happening in our nation. Mm -hmm. By golly, your blood is as red as mine. Amen. Why? Because his blood was read. Mm -hmm. And so right now, it, it, I'm tired of it. I am sick and tired of it. And enough is enough. But let me tell you, Gishelle, some of this stems from white privilege. And that's a term that I haven't understood what that was for a, a, lot, of, a lot of years. I now know what white privilege is. And sometimes people deny that there's even such a thing as that. We understand every panelist here, every person listening today probably says, yes, 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 racism is bad. We should not be racist, right? Absolutely. But does everybody recognize that these little white faces right here have had a lot of privilege in our Barbara, life. But you have people that are watching that will say, I am not racist, and they are. I know, right. they I know. Even, and that's the thing that's so scary about right. it. Right. Mm -hmm. When sure. you have grown up in a family, in a culture, yeah. that had certain belief systems, and you have carried those belief systems on into your life and into the life of your children right. and your grandchildren, you don't even know you're being racist. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. They, they don't even know it. Mm -hmm. And that's the really sad part. But that it stems is. from white privilege, too, because we grew up like we grew up, and this is, this is what we know. I had never heard a white person acknowledge there was white privilege <laughs> until I met Kristen King. <laughs> <laughs> the day she said it. You remember the day hmm. she said it, and I said, what? Wow. 
because again, yeah. we live in denial. Yes, yes. In order, absolutely. For sure. In order for us to get better, we yeah. have to be honest mm -hmm. about not where we are, but who we are. Yes. When I stand and look in the mirror in the morning, there are some questions that I need to ask myself. There are some, some things I need to say to myself before I leave my house. I need to be able to acknowledge that every person I meet mm -hmm. is yeah. equal to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The guy standing on the street that's that. homeless, that has the little basket that, or the little sign Absolutely. that says we'll work for food. We have dehumanized those people how? Yes. Mm -hmm. We won't even make eye contact. That's right. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So Listen. Deborah, let me ask you this, because this is really big. Can a person of color, that's you, right? Be You're racist? Looking, yeah, can you yes. be racist? Well, yes, and I, <laughs> let me answer that question for you, because, and I say that because, and we can talk about racism from, ver from various angles, but let me say this. One would say no, because racism is really about power and about feeling supreme. But let me give you yeah. give it to you from this angle. My great great grandmother was born into slavery. Mm -hmm. Okay. How many greats? My great great grandmother. Okay. Okay. Some of the things that mm. she endured, some of the things that her parents endured, caused them to be angry. Mm -hmm. Of course. Okay. When you have those kinds of situations in your life, yeah. You are angry, and now you can be angry and hate, have hatred towards an entire group of people. Sure. Right. And they, the people you're looking at had nothing to do with Well, the, the reason I you. asked the question is because I almost want to say, how can you not be racist? Especially if we lived back in the 1700s and 1800s when there were slaves. And, and I, it's, it's, let's say I'm a, a, a black in slave. In the early 1900s, right. Barbara. In the early 1900s, yeah. <laughs> could I not be racist, right? I don't know how well, you fight that. I think that. it's important to know that, you know, we say slavery is abolished, but it's not abolished. No, it's not. It's evolved. It's, it's right. And yes. it looks different. It does. And I know this is controversial, but I want to bring it up because I think it's really important. You know, over the last few weeks, we've had a lot of debates about the Confederate monuments yeah. around town and the removal of those. Mm -hmm. And I think there is um, a key piece of information that's not being shared. <clears throat> and if you chart when these monuments were erected, they exactly. were not erected after the mm -hmm. Confederacy lost the war. They were not erected then to memorialize the men who fought for the Confederacy. Right. They were erected during Jim Crow in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and they were erected during the Civil Rights Movement mm -hmm. as racial terror items to remind black people, African Americans, that they were still mm -hmm. a lesser species, yeah. that they were still a lesser group of people. So, I'm all for not erasing history. However, monuments of this type belong in a museum. They belong in a cemetery. Right. They do not belong mm -hmm. on the steps yeah. of our courthouse to this day to remind people yeah. of what that is. They're subliminal, mm -hmm. is that the right word? That's yeah. a great yeah. word. Yes. word. Reminders mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. oppression and terrorism. Mm -hmm. Can I tell You're you something so right. that's funny mm -hmm. about that? I can guarantee you that African-American I want to say children because I'm kind of old, I guess. But I'm thinking anybody that's 30 and younger, they probably don't know the history of the monuments. They don't. Okay. In all honesty, if I can just say this, we don't care why those monuments are there. And those monuments don't bother me one bit. I am not intimidated by that statue because I know who I am Come on. and no white supremacist, neo-Nazi, all right person gets to dictate who yeah. I am. That's right. And 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 and, and I, I think that's probably the mindset, the attitude of most black people. Huh. Okay. However, uh -huh. what those statues have done, or the attempts to take them down has done, is it has taken us back to because we, you know, we thought we were pretty far along. Mm -hmm. It's brought the truth to light mm -hmm. because the people that are coming out and having such a big to do about the monuments, why are they doing that? Because those monuments represent for them really who they are and what they stand for. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what they're, what they're saying, someone said they are trying to change our culture. I said this before and I'll say it again. There's a difference between 
my ethnic group and my culture. Explain You're that. trying to change our culture. The culture of the white supremacists is not the same as the culture of Barbara Beck, of Kristen King. Mm-hmm. You don't get lumped mm-hmm. into that category mm-hmm. because you're right. white. Right. Their culture is we hate people that are different from right. us. Okay. And we will do whatever we right. can to make sure we hate them and that we do everything we can to keep them in their place. Mm-hmm. That's their culture. And that's what we're trying to hold on to. Yeah, maybe we change the culture. You know, we always talk about, oh, our culture, this is a terrible, well, let's do something about it. Maybe we make some positive strides toward changing our culture. We're not changing history, ethnicity, race, we're changing culture. And we put those monuments in a museum so that, yes, we can preserve history and we can look at it Mm -hmm. and we can say, this is who we were, but -hmm. this is not who we are. Mm -hmm. But we have people that are saying, this is who we are Mm -hmm. and we are not changing and you are not taking down my monuments. (laughs) Deborah, What a culture. I have to say this because what Kristen said earlier, like I would never ever call somebody, you know, a bad name that, you know, is African-American. But when she said earlier about white trash, now I've done that. It was so convicting. It was like, oh my gosh. You know, because they are. When she said that too, I thought, well, but they are white trash. But see, you're doing the same thing. So <laughs> right? Like, but it's it a is, heart it is issue. You got yeah. it. It's it's this whole idea that I'm better than them, and that is wrong. Yeah, right. So it can lead all the way. You know, I would ne- I would never consider myself racist, but yeah. but I would call somebody mm-hmm. white trash. I mean, that's. Just as bad. Like, it's a, right. it's my heart problem. Yeah. Well, it's a sin problem. Yeah. I mean, we have to come back to that. This is about, it's a sin. It's pride. The Bible says pride cometh before fall. Anytime that mm-hmm. we think we're better than anybody. Yep. Look at Paul. I mean, he could have been a bigot of all bigots. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was out there ministering to the very people that mm-hmm. he hated. I mean, it's all through the Bible. You know, but God was very clear. You don't call my people that. You don't treat my people like that. I mean, God set the standard for us. And I really believe, I hope in these conversations today, my prayer is that we are different, that we begin to teach others how it's supposed to look, not I mean, Paul said, forgetting that which is behind me, but he was talking about his successes. He wasn't talking about his pain because you and I were talking about our pain is who, what makes us who we are today. But somewhere here as Christians, if we do not begin to stand up and talk a different talk, begin to get in the word, can get in these can scriptures. We, can we, can we I, I know this is Christian TV. Mm-hmm. Can we take it beyond Christians? Mm-hmm. Sure. Because there are some people that are Christians mm-hmm. that are racist. There are some people that are non-Christians that are not. Mm -hmm. But we need to be leading. I believe us as Christians need to be leading. We should be set apart. I don't disagree with with that, but this is not a Christian issue. This is a humanity issue. No doubt. This is a morality issue that Mm -hmm. exists in our country across the board. Amen. Okay. But I can't control any of those people, but we've got Christian people who are watching today and our pastors in our churches. I mean, whether if it's a black or a white church or a mixed church, don't you think that we all need to come together and begin to get in the word and begin to say, how do we make the changes? Because my question I wanted to ask you today was tell me what healing looks like, because we need to begin to speak what healing looks like so everybody knows what is tangible so we can begin. I know for me, I'm ready to do whatever I got to do. I'll go out and fight. You're not literally, but you know. <laughs> I, I want to be there. But I, see, you're so, you're advanced. There are so know, many people in this country, Christians and non-Christians alike, know. who will not accept the truth that there's disparity in our criminal justice system, that there's disparity True. in the way Education, we look at people, in the in way, system. not everyone, you know, is at a place where they can move forward. And and I think it's important that, that our viewers know and that other people know, like there is disparity. I just want to give this one statistic. Yeah. I know we're running out of time, but... Black people, let's see, 10% of black people use drugs. 9% of white people use drugs. 
8% of Hispanic people use drugs. Black people are 900% more likely to become convicted and incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with actual drug use. Right. Because the drug mm -hmm. use is pretty much the it same is. within percentages mm -hmm. of our race. Hispanic people is the next group to become incarcerated. And white people are the bottom. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's true. That right. is, those are actual facts. Right. But many people are not willing to admit that there's disparity, and that is the biggest example of white privilege, where mm -hmm. we can turn our heads and say, "It doesn't affect." We're us. treated differently. But what I'm saying is, is, is that the beginning of healing for us is to look to see, admit that's what I'm it. To admit it. Right. I think that what we need to be have the conversation is, what does healing look like? Because for me, I'll get out there. I'll be the crusader. Of come on, I'll be the cheerleader. No, because. Listen, I want us, I love the scripture. It says 130, Psalms 133, behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Guys, right. is this for right. truth or is it not truth? Right. If so, Absolutely. teach me Absolutely. how to live it. It's okay. called systemic racism. There you go. There you go. Okay, guess what, right. ladies? Let's do it. We are so out of time. I and here's know. what I want our viewers to do today. I want you to continue this conversation at home with your loved ones around the dinner table. Start talking about racism. Yes. What is it? What does it mean? Acknowledge that it exists and then make some positive strides toward ending racism in your home, in your family, in your churches, in your workplaces. So we've got more for you. <laughs> So stay with us and we'll be right back. Welcome friends. I'm Tracy Strawberry and I would like to draw you in to the word of God as we visit this difficult but much needed topic discussion on racial tension. Sadly, there is a strained mental physical and emotional force driving, dividing, and harming individuals, groups, and even nations due to racism. Racism involves the idea that one's own race is superior and has the right to dominate others or that a particular racial group is inferior to the others. The Word of God describes the difficult times that we would experience living in these last days, which began when Jesus rose from the dead. In these current times, we are bearing witness to the truths in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. There is a great sense of urgency to share the gospel and live God's way. Where there is godlessness, there is lawlessness. Where there is lawlessness, there is brokenness. Conquering racial tension requires us to embrace genuine faith. The natural opinions and ideals in the minds of people are producing great darkness, division, and even death among all ages and races. This has to stop. The truth of God's word is the direction manual for how we can overcome the severe injustices we are experiencing and many participating within our society. It's not enough to know different. We must become different so we can do different. God is no respecter of persons. We are to show no partiality, as the word of God says. We are all one in Christ Jesus for those of us who belong to him. Racism is sin, plain and simple. James chapter 2, verse 9 states that if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the laws of transgressors. Sinful acts are lived out through a heart that does not know God nor lives for him. It produces a stony, desperately wicked heart capable of committing thoughts, ideas, and actions of the most violent nature. Only Jesus is powerful enough to deliver one from a heart of stone and wickedness. His promise to all that come to him is to give us a new heart. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, he says, And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. 
This is not just a polished dissertation. This is a desperate cry and plea for us to rise up as a society and get right with God. It is incomprehensible to me what a human being is capable of thinking about or doing to another human being. In the end, we are all beautiful souls created in the image and likeness of God. We love our children the same, we bleed the same and feel pain. The gospel is still the only power that conquers the powers of darkness, saves souls and heals human hearts. Won't you do your part? Won't you resign yourself to surrender to the power of Jesus Christ in the process of change? Won't you commit to loving one another as Jesus loves us? If you're not willing to surrender to Christ, then won't you take the stand, regardless of what you believe, to respect and honor human life? There is a sense of urgency to share the gospel and genuinely live for Christ. I think our senior pastor, Pastor Tim Johnson of Orlando World Outreach Center, says it best. We must become the change we want to see. Bye for now. I hope you got a lot out of our program today. You know, when we talk about racism, racial tension, even racial reconciliation, all kinds of emotions run rampant. Even Christ followers can't agree on how to treat others who are not like us. So how do we stay the course of the Christian life when all around us is hatred, strife, mistreatment of our fellow man, and other cruel and irresponsible behaviors? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, author and theologian from the early 1900s, wrote about cheap grace and comfortable Christianity. Rather, he called us to a life of radical obedience and repentance. He said, cheap grace is preaching forgiveness without repentance. Our country is in dire need of repentance. Even we as Christians need to turn from our wicked ways to repent. Since the beginning of time, we've looked down our noses at those who are not like us, those of a different color, race, or religion. So how do we stay the course? Once again, I refer to Bonhoeffer, who said it best, and I quote, Who stands fast? Only the man whose final standard is not his reason, his principles, his conscience, his freedom, or his virtue, but who is ready to sacrifice all this when he is called to obedient and responsible action in faith and in exclusive allegiance to God. The responsible man who tries to make his whole life an answer to the question and call of God, end of quote. It always comes back to God and the reason that we're put on this planet, to live a life pleasing to God, to honor Him with our lives, to act like Jesus would have acted, to understand and live a higher calling. Perhaps this program today inspires you to respond to challenging situations, to racism with a different attitude, one based not on reason, not on emotion, not even on common sense, but rather on faith in God, His standards, His responses. And that, dear friends, is our note of hope for today. Thanks so much for watching and God bless you.